Kshatriyas, they fight with weapons and they become powerful. More power is there in the Brahman that I've seen than Vishwami. And Vishwami was such a Kshatri. He thought he would overcome Vashishtha, but he couldn't be understood. The power of the Brahman is more. So the Kshatriyas, they used to fight first taking blessings from the Brahmins. And not only blessings, but they became empowered by the Brahmins. Here we see that Shukracharya was the guru of the demons. He, by his blessings and by his instructions, Dali Maharaj became very powerful. And he, although Dali Maharaj called himself, I am not sinful, he had taken over the heavenly planets, which he hadn't earned his way to the heavenly planets. But as a Kshatriya, it was his right to attack and overtake some other kingdom. That's, you're more powerful than you take it over. But to, how do we say, make his position stable. Shukracharya wanted to engage Bali Maharaj in performing sacrifices because actually one can only go to the heavenly planets by pious activities. Indra is known as Shatakratu because he performed 100 Ashwamedha sacrifices by which he became eligible to become Indra. So Bali Maharaj, he wasn't actually eligible to be in the position of Indra. But somehow he got that position. So to make him strong enough to fit in that position, to maintain that position, Shukrachari was engaging Bali Maharaj in sacrifices. Now we see that Vishnu has come in the form of a little Brahmin boy. And Shukrachari, because he's a powerful Brahmin, he can understand exactly what's going to happen. That this boy, when he appeared on the horizon, he looked like another sun, more than bright than the sun god. So different people in the sun god are saying, who is this? Maybe it's the sun god, maybe it's one of the Kumaras, he's so effulgent. But Shukrachari can understand is his vision, who is mentioned in this verse by Bali Maharaj, is my enemy. Actually, Bali Maharaj, He's the king of the demons, and the demons always think of Vishnu as their enemy. Bali Maharaj was superficially a demon, actually he was a great devotee. He was trained up by Prahlad Maharaj, his grandfather, to be a great devotee. So he didn't think of Vishnu as his enemy, but superficially, because he was 
performing his swadharma, and being the king of his external Vanashram duty, and being the king of the demons. Therefore, he took over the heavenly planets and he, could, he went along with his social position. Although, as a pure devotee of Krishna, we can understand he wasn't interested in lordship over different kingdoms, he wasn't interested in power, prestige, or any of these things we, that we can see because he's immediately ready to give it up just like that. We could give up all these things because his real aim was to satisfy Vishnu. That was his But anyway, just like Arjuna was told by Krishna, you have to perform your duty as a Shatri. And at the same time, things are So Bali Maharaj was doing that. And in conversation with Shukracharya, he's presenting that yes, Vishnu is our enemy. But uh, now that he's come to reject Shukracharya, he's giving so many reasons. Shukracharya had engaged Bali Maharaj in so many he was performing sacrifices. In sacrifice, the Yagya Bhuk, or Yagyeshva, the enjoyer of the sacrifice, the controller of the sacrifice, he is Lord Vishnu. All sacrifices had to be offered to Lord Vishnu. Of course, when the karmis perform sacrifices, they offer everything to, to Lord Vishnu in sacrifice, but that's not exactly the same as bhakti, devotion, because they're doing for the sake of some material benefit. That's karma yoga in its or karma kanda in its uh, fruitive activities. Some touch of Vishnu worship is there, but there's no proper understanding of who Vishnu is. They think we're offering to Vishnu and having offered to Vishnu, we offer to Indra and we offer to all the different demigods and they think that Lord Vishnu is just another one of the demigods. There's no proper understanding, no clear understanding. Shukracharya was engaging Bali Maharaj in further activities for worshipping Vishnu. Everything is supposed to be offered to Vishnu. So when Vishnu came and he said, now you offer everything to me. Bali Maharaj, that's all he wanted to do because he was trained by Prahlad Maharaj. He identified himself as the grandson of Prahlad. He uh, referred to himself as Paradibi, I am the grandson. Pallad Maharaj. He didn't say, he didn't call himself Vairocha, and the son of Virocha. He always identified himself as the son of Pallad because Pallad is a great devotee, and Virocha was a typical demon. He wasn't. But then again, Bali Maharaj was. So he identified himself as the son of Pallad, and Pallad had taught him what did Pallad teach? What was the best thing Pallad learned? Guru will teach the disciple what he has learned from his guru. And when Pallad was asked by his father, what is the best thing you have learned? What did he say? Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Svanam, Pada, Sevanam, Arjanam, Nandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atham, Nivedanam, Itipam, Sarpita, Vishnu, Bhaktis, Chay, Navalakshanam, Kriyeta, Bhagavad, Gada, and Nandi, Dita, Mutrana. This is the topmost learning. To hear about Vishnu, to chant about Vishnu, to remember Vishnu, to serve the lotus feet of Vishnu, to pray to Vishnu, Arjanam, Nandanam, to worship God Vishnu. To identify oneself as the servant of Vishnu, to, ident to identify oneself as the friend of Vishnu, and surrender everything to Vishnu. This is the best learning. So when Vishnu comes and says, Can you please offer something to me, then definitely Bali Maharaj is going to, to want to offer. And Bali Maharaj was to become famous of, for fulfilling his dictum of Prahlad Maharaj, Atmani Vedanam. Atmani Vedanam, the great example is Bali Maharaj who gave himself and all his possessions, everything in his possession. We find difficult, we're attached to this, we have some small thing. We took my dhoti, they come angry if someone takes it. The story is that Ramanujajan with all his disciples, that uh, he arranged that all the copins, the underwear, because sannyasis and brahmacharis traditionally don't have many possessions, so if someone, steal, if someone steals your underwear, you may feel very upset, you may be half your possessions. But uh, how upset they became. Ramanujacharya was... You all know that story? Ramanujacharya just wanted to show some of his disciples how attached they were. So he arranged for their underwear to be stolen. And then they all became very, very upset. And then later on he showed his some householder disciples how all their jewels were stolen. But they weren't at all. Because they... The brahmacharis were thinking, the householders are so attached, we're so renounced. So anyway, it was more than some underwear that was 
stolen. But uh, the whole universe, so much endeavor. <coughs> Wasn't that you see, you read in Srimad Bhagavatam that Ali Maharaj attacked and Indra ran away, but can you imagine it be all the planning that went into it and organizing the armies and how they had to perform sacrifices to get some strength. So much endeavor is not a, a small thing to remove Indra from the heavenly planets. And then when he got to the heavenly planets, then he gradually, first of all he kicked out Indra and then he gradually took over the whole universe. And then, ah, here I am. Now I am the king of the universe. As we heard yesterday, when you get some possessions, you may tend to become proud. Now I'm the king of the universe. Can you imagine? If you're a temple commander, you may be proud. I'm temple commander. But if you're king of the universe, not, and not only not inherited king, but you took on your own power, and how fucked up you like, how attached the whole universe you could look down. Of course, above there's Janaloka, Tantaloka, Mahaloka, Brahmaloka. But that's the, that's the planet of the Rishis. The, the demigods and demons, they don't care about that anymore. They're not interested in being Rishis. They want to enjoy it. So you've got all the planets in the universe where you enjoy. Of course, how can you enjoy? Even if you have so many planets, what can you enjoy anyway? Because your bodily facility is limited. You can only eat so much, you can only drink so much, you can only enjoy with so many women. Even if you have all the women in the universe, you can't enjoy them all. Although you can enjoy thinking, they're all my property. So anyway, Dali Maharaj had everything, everything in his possession. But he wasn't attached. What a great example. Atman Evadan. This is the example. Bhagavad means we're hearing about Lord Vishnu in his different incarnations and about his devotees and how they surrender to Krishna. We're hearing about the great devotees. Prithu Maharaj, Yudhishthir Maharaj, Parikshit Maharaj, Dali Maharaj. We're hearing what, what is the story of their life? How they've surrendered everything to Krishna. How then, under all circumstances, unfailing, Yudhishthira Maharaj, same thing, everything taken away, just lost everything, it still maintains full faith. Kunti Devi, such a great devotee, everyone's going and praying to Krishna, solve all my problems. And she's saying, give me problems, because I want problems, so I can remember you. Who will, who in the universe will pray like this? Give me problems. All of you go to Tirupati temple, so many people will be standing there for hours and hours and hours just to get five seconds darshan if they're lucky, three seconds. Deal. That's enough. You put the money in the box and you pray, okay, I gave you one lakh of rupees, now you give me ten lakhs. Or you, you saw, help me pass my exam, whatever. I shake my head. I gave something to you, I gave you all my hairs, now you give me all the, all the solutions. So they're going. Who is going and praying? Dear Lord, you kindly give me more problems. Why? So that I can remember you. These are the pure devotees. These are examples. Unusual. People will say you are crazy. All the demons said Bali Maharaj was crazy. That he'd be God. Not only they said he was crazy, they were very upset with him. All his friends from childhood, and all his advisors, he went against them all. There was no one standing there saying, you should surrender to Lord Vishnu. Everyone was saying, don't do it. You're making a big mistake. You're going to, you're going to be arrested. And he was. It was true. What they said. He lost everything. He was arrested. He was thrown out of the enemy planet. Everything they said was true. But he thought, all right, it doesn't matter. But I have to satisfy my mission under any circumstances. So we're getting uh, instruction from the great devotee how we can act. But we're living in this world. So many people will say, don't do, don't surrender, don't serve Krishna. So there'll be so many. Oh, so many people will give different uh, interpretations, what you should do, how you have a new idea. We have the example in Bhagavata. We have the example, uh, of course you may think, very remote, Bhagavata Maharaj was so many millions of years ago, very remote. And you see that Krishna kindly sends into this world great devotees. We saw, how was the festival for? Remembering Prabhupada, of course, Nayam is still one who says Yashastri Samadhyam. We glorify three times a day. For every moment, we should glorify Prabhupada. But uh, especially we have the festival for glorifying Prabhupada. Remember those qualities. Not simply for glorification, but for emulation. 
not that we can emulate, but to follow in the footsteps of the great devotees. So Prabhupada, typical pure devotee, like Bali Maharaj, surrendered everything to Vishnu. We say again and again, it's very difficult to imagine how someone in the old age can go across the world, struggle, no friends, no one, same thing as Bali Maharaj, no one, no one encouraged him. Although nowadays you'll find so many people who said, actually I told him to go to America, it was my idea. Although actually the fact is, no one encouraged him, no one supported him. He had to go through so many difficulties. Even in America, no one helped him. There's so many setbacks, but Atma Nivedana. I have to give myself, even if I die in serving Krishna. That will be glorious. Nowadays we hear so many people, so many devotees that are afraid of some upcoming holocaust, apocalypse. What shall we do? Shall we go to sit on the top of a mountain in New Zealand? Or find some desert island where there's at least one tree I can get something to eat from. Let me run away and survive. But you won't survive. Whatever you do, you won't survive. Because the Holocaust, always there's a Holocaust. The whole material world is a Holocaust. Everyone is dying. Ahani, ahani, bhutani, kacham, dihayamala. Everyone is dying. If someone, uh, I, mean, I don't want to suggest it, but if somehow or other all the, everyone was here was to suddenly die, then it would be in the news, oh, or so many people have died, or the plane crash, recently there was a plane crash in New York, just outside of New York. So many people died all at once. So it's big world news, very bad, they all died. But anyway, they are all going to die. So many, how many people die in a plane crash? 250 people. But anyway, every day, thousands and thousands of people are dying in America. How is that? Right? Someone dies from old age. Even in New York, more than 250 people die a day from abortion. What about that? That's another holocaust. So many people are dying. You have to die anyway. So with that understanding, a devotee acts that now in this lifetime I have to Surrender to Krishna. Let me do something to serve Krishna. Although I'm going to die anyway. If I die in the service of Krishna, that is glorious. That's what Prabhupada thought. He came to the Western countries. I would say, you'll die then. That's very good. If I die preaching, that's very good. Prabhupada said that. But when he was very sick, and uh, he was in America, and they told him, just rest. Really. Prabhupada was packing up, walking out, going outside, and everyone's also saying, no, no, stay here, rest a few days. Prabhupada just walking out without listening to them. And still they're saying, please stay here. Prabhupada turned around and said, you do not understand. I want the benediction from Krishna that I will die on the battlefield just like Arjuna. Let me do, let me do something for Krishna. Anyway, this body has to pass out, drop dead. But in the, in the meantime, let me do something for Krishna. This was the mood of Bali Maharaj. That, all right, I did so much for the demons, what they wanted me to do. I did my worldly duty. But really, my duty is to Krishna. There are two kinds of swadharma. Swadharma, on the material platform, means to do your duty as a family man, to do your, whatever ashram, Brahmachari, Sanyasi, whatever ashram you may be in, you should perform your duty. But there's another swadharma. That means swadharma according to the body. But swadharma of the soul is to surrender to Krishna. So in Gita, Krishna tells us that we should perform our worldly duties, but above and beyond that, we have to perform our highest duty of surrender. That is the duty of the soul, to surrender to Krishna. Now here we see, in, in Gita, we see that Arjuna's swadharma, to surrender to Krishna, because Krishna directly told him that you fight for me, don't fight for yourself. Arjuna said, I don't want to fight for my own sake. What's the use? I'll be an, either I'll kill all my kinsmen or I'll die anyway, it's all bad. So Krishna said, don't fight for your own sake, but fight for my sake. You have to fight. You do your duty, worldly duty, but you do it for my sake. But here we see that Bali Maharaj is Swadharma. As the king of the demons, he's supposed to act for the interest of the demons. As the king of the demons, he's supposed to reject here 
Vishnu has come as an enemy. So he should reject the enemy. Even though he's come as a Brahmin boy, he should think of... As Shukracharya said, you promise. But now you have to see. You have to see how to diplomatically avoid breaking your promise. So according to his Swadharma as a Kshatriya, as a king, as the king of the demons, he should have followed Shukracharya's advice. But unlike Arjuna's case, where his worldly Swadharma was was in line with his duty of highest duty of surrendering to Krishna. Here his worldly duty came into conflict with his duty to Krishna. So he's showing the example that if there's a conflict, what should we do? What is our highest dharma? Here the word is given, adharma ina. Uh, that Vishnu is being adharma. It's not possible. Actually, whatever Vishnu does or says, that is dharma. That is the very definition of dharma. But here Bali Maharaj is saying, even if Vishnu acts in a, in a non-religious way, still I have to fulfill my dharma, which is to surrender to him. And sometimes that, uh, that misunderstanding may come. They'll say, Krishna is lying. Krishna, you see here, Krishna is coming to steal. He's a thief. He's a cheater. He's a rascal. According to the external consideration. But his stealing and cheating and rascal them, that is dharma. Why has he come to do this? He could just he could just come in his 400 forms and say, Here I am, I'm Vishnu, give it to me. And Bali Maharaj will say yes. Or even he doesn't have to do that. He, he's God himself. He just has to say, Okay, folks, the party's over. I'm God and get out of here. Give the kingdom back to Indra. He's my young, he's my elder brother. I like him. He could do that. But why is he coming all this dressed as a little boy, taking the form? The little boy and all this joke, joking, to have some fun. This is called lila. Lila means play pastime. He passes his time. Many people ask, "What do you do in the spiritual? Life? How do you pass your time?" The Christian idea: you sit on a cloud and strum a harp. How do you pass your time? What does he do? Time pass. In India, there's time pass. How do you pass your time? What is God doing? Wonderful pastimes, wonderful leaders, wonderful activities. How he's cheating, but why is he cheating Bali Maharaj? To have a little fun. Let's have some fun. Let's, let's go and enjoy with Bali Maharaj. See what he does. Because he knows Bali Maharaj is not, actually he's not a demon at all. He's my great devotee. All this time he has to pretend that he's not a devotee, he's a demon. And okay, let's go and kill the demigods. And he's calling Vishnu his enemy. But actually in his heart of hearts, he just wants to worship Lord Vishnu. It's just a big drag for him, having to pretend that he's a non-devotee. So, Bali Maharaj, Lord Brahman is coming. All right, enough of this. Now, let's see. Are you a devotee or a demon? We know he's, he knows he's a devotee. He knows he's not going to. He's not, he's, he knows that he'll reject Shukracha. He knows that he'll follow the advice of Jai So, to have a little fun. Okay, let's have a little fun. Let's humiliate Bali Maharaj. He's humiliated. All the, demi, all the demons are saying, you fool, we told you. Why did you, what's the use of your being so religious? Anyway, we're demons, what are you being so religious for? We're supposed to be irreligious. We're supposed to be irreligious. What are you being, making such a big show of being such a good guy, a moralist? We're demons, come on. So he yeah, yeah, was humiliated by them, tied up. Uh, everyone's saying, yeah, you see, we fought for you, we made all this kingdom, we're ready to support you, we can kill all the, we can kill all the demigods and you're such a fool, you gave it all away. Humiliated. But that humiliation turns into his eternal glory. And now he's remembered forever as the great, great devotee who is willing to be humiliated, who is willing to give up everything, who just, without any forewarning, dropped everything. Yes, whatever you have, Mama Sadeo, Geo, Joki, Chumor, the whole universe, take it. It's all yours, it's not mine, it's all yours. Anyway. So he's become glorious forever. And how glorious! That Lord Vishnu, who is the controller, who is who's the controller of multi-universes, he's come to be the doorkeeper of Bali Maharaj. Doorkeeper. In India, you have the peon, Chokida. He's a very low position, actually. Hey, call the Chokida, bring some water. He's, he's come to become the menial servant. So this is the uh, menial servant of Bali Maharaj. So this is Krishna showing his wonderful pastimes. Here in Vrindavan, mostly we celebrate 
the Krishna, the 10th canto pastimes, but all the pastimes in Bhagavatam, they're all very sweet and full of nectar. So this pastime is very, very nice. How Lali Maharaj, he gave everything to Lord Vishnu, including his own head. So, Krishna reciprocates. You gave yourself to me, then what can I have to give you something back? So what is there to give? It's only me. You gave me the universe, so, so uh, I already told, I'll, I'll give that back to you later. So in the meantime, I have to give you something. All right, I'll give myself to you. He became himself the servant of Bali Maharaj. The Lord, he prefers them. If the devotees, they become the servant of the Lord, and the Lord, the Lord prefers, I will become the servant of the devotee. Krishna carrying shoes of Nanda Maharaj on his head. Can you imagine? What, can you imagine? Would you like, would anyone like to? I, no one can think. You take your shoes and bring on, put on the deity. No one can imagine such a thing. You can't. If you do, you'll go to hell. Definitely. But Krishna himself is thinking, Nanda Maharaj, my father, let me bring his shoes. And he's putting on his head. Is Nanda Maharaj going to hell? Not at all. He's the topmost of them. This is a devotion. You can't understand. It's not your ABC of spiritual life. The highest power, the devotees completely give themselves to Krishna. And Krishna in return completely gives himself to Krishna. So this we hear in Bhagavatam. When we did. Just so we can imbibe this mood. Giving ourselves so many things. We have to discuss defeating Maya bodies. So many things. But that is all on the platform. Why are we are fighting with Maya Bhadi? Because we have and Vedana want to give ourselves a vision. Maya Bhadi is against vision. Why? Why should we hate Maya Bhadi? We don't hate him. We hate that person. There are also people, two hands, two legs, and they're probably nice to each other. They're probably well behaved, good moralists. And why are we so much against? Because they're against Lord Vishnu. Devotee, because he surrendered to Krishna. He cannot stand on the side of someone, even if they're nice, even if they're moralist. If they're against Vishnu, no, we reject. So Bhagavatam is teaching us. Atmanivedya. This is the platform on, on, on which all the, uh, everything develops. By surrendering to Krishna, then all the ecstasies of spiritual life, which is our birthright, First, there has to be surrender. Not cheap print. It doesn't come just by imagining it, but actual surrender. When we're actually ready to surrender, like Bali Maharaj. Then, like Bali Maharaj, Krishna will give himself to us. That's being shown here. Yeah, the question is that the Kshatriya has to, he is within Kshatriya Dharma, it's considered religious to take over another kingdom, to, to fight and overcome. But if the other Kshatriya is ruling religiously, then how is that right? Well, one Kshatriya might, um, especially if another Kshatriya is not ruling according to with ruling according to religious principles, then he may take over. But even if he is ruling according to religious principles, he may, you see in South India, in the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Pratapavutra Maharaj was fighting with that, uh, what was his name, Krishna Devaraj from Hampi, Vijayanath. They were both Vaishnavs. They were fighting. Have you ever seen anything like that in our movie? Seems they're all Vaishnavas, but they're fighting over. So, probably, so I can't remember where it's going to explain how the more powerful king will take over. And then the other kings, they may continue to rule as a subordinate, but by those who are more powerful, they can protect better. Anyway, that's in their blood. They're, they'll be fighting. It's like Krishna told that journey. You have to fight. <coughs> if you think you're going to run away and become a yogi, no, you, you want to run away to the forest? You're already in the forest for 12 years. What do you think you're going to... In the forest, what were the Pandavas doing? They weren't just... Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudeva. They were fighting one fight after another. Because they're Kshatriyas. 
They are always fighting, even if they go to the forest. Arjuna went up to the enemy planets and fought all the Nivata Kamachas. He was fighting with Lord Shiva and Bhima was fighting. There was one Rakshasa after them. They're always going to be fighting. So, Mahamana Smara Yudhya think of me and them, Krishna says. Of course, that's not particularly meant for our movement. Because in, in the beginning of Gita, we see, what is that? Sarga Yudha Visharada. That's also Bhagavad Gita. Where uh, Yodhana says to Dhritarashtra that all the soldiers, they're very expert in fighting. So, actually, that's not, that's not supposed to be the part of Bhagavad Gita for us. Ours is supposed to be Abhayam Sattva Sankshadhyaya Jnana Yoga Vivasti. We're not supposed to be imitating the uh, Duryodhana and the Kuru Kshetra. We're supposed to be Sadhus. Now we're going to have a Sarve Yudha Visharada kind of question. I predict. As Shukacharya could predict, I can also predict. Yes? Very happy to hear you speak, I'd just like to comment at the beginning of your speech, of course, we all say only the Lord one with the Vasudevaya, the famous verse. Mm-hmm. And in that book what it is said that the book Bhagavad and the Christian Bhagavad are identical. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, I can't remember if it's exactly in that book, but if it's anyway it's for sure. Recall this, uh, you very well asked earlier. You recall this being in fact. Of course, yes. That that's his uh in Chaitanya Charitamrita also. It's in the first chapter, the prophet says, the Lord Bhagavat and the Christian Bhagavat are identical, mm. and both of them, or either of them, are competent remedies to go back to God. Mm. So when they read Bhagavat's book, which was there, the Christian is there. Mm. Right? Definitely. But I'd like to bring everyone's attention to the 34th verse of the 4th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And in that footboard, the new edition there is added a sentence that says, Nor by the independent study of books can one advance in spiritual life. Mm-hmm. The original footboard does not have that statement. Brahma says the original footboard that dry arguments and mental speculation cannot help one advance in spiritual life. Mm-hmm. So why this uh, seemingly contradictory statement is put in Brahma's books that I feel is a very awful lot to say that by the mere study of books, Prabhupada's books, we've been reading billions of verse to read one word from you. So perhaps you can tell me... Yeah, this is another of those, as, uh, as I predicted, you see, I'm also a great brahman. Well, you would be very great to answer the question of why this is there. Um, exactly why that particular statement was changed, or if it was changed, I would have to ask Jayadvaita Swami to change it. He did, along with Dravida Prabhu, produce a pamphlet explaining why there were many changes that, for instance, there is one statement in the old editions which said there is a planet of the trees, but actually it should have been the planet of the pit trees. It's quite a... or where Krishna says about the universal form, uh, Pashati, just see, and then Someone has translated it. It looks like the universal form looks like the sea. Anyway, as I said, this, this statement, then, then, Prabhu, then uh, maybe there are many, many controversies. This is one of them. I would just like you to, to tell me, is this an incorrect statement or a correct statement? I, I, as I say, I don't know because, uh, I don't know because, I have to ask Jai Maharaj, I don't know why, he, the particular reason why he made a new change in, in, his, in the Bhagavad Gita conference. As you obviously distrust him in that no, way. I don't distrust him, I just know. But I would, I, would, I would request that, as there may be many controversies. If you want, I could probably, and you also too, could probably bring up more than 100, con- let's have the 108 controversial issues of the day. But uh, at least in the Bhagavad, we may discuss controversies elsewhere, as will be going on, undoubtedly. But let us keep the Bhagavatam class as Prabhupada for discussion of Bhagavad philosophy. Yes, well, we used to have this to those who want to read for these kind of points within the distance. All right, I'm going to take the, uh, the position of the chair and override you on this point. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hmm? You want me to read the verse again? All right. Yadyapya sadha dharmena maam bhadniyad anadasam tatapya nam nahim zishye bhitam brahma tanum ripam Although he is Vishnu himself, out of fear he has covered himself in the form of a Brahmana, 
to come to me begging under the circumstances because he has assumed the form of a brahmana even if he religiously arrests me or even kills me I shall not retaliate even though he is my enemy yes we expect to learn the question now Without the question is that in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu said that Sakyamana and Ivedana they are difficult processes. Prabhupada describes in the seventh canto of Prabhupada that these are actually the previous seven are, can be executed in the state of sadhana, but when one is perfect, then Sakyamana and Ivedana come. So can one go back to Godhead without Atma and Ivedana? The answer is no. That's it. It's a one word answer. Atma and Ivedana and going back to Godhead are simultaneous anyway. But it, it is also something cultivated. So that when we say surrender, all right, everyone here is surrendered, it's presumed. When you Dikka Kali, Bhakta Kali, Atta Shamalpam, at the time of initiation, one surrenders himself. So it's surrender is you surrender to follow four regular principles, chant 16 rounds, and attend Mongolati, we hope, and all this. There's a certain, but there are levels of surrender. So when one is completely surrendered, then he's completely pure and he's back to God. Mm. But he said that I am a devotee of Krishna. Bali Maharaj is now is, uh, he's also, he did, but uh, he said that uh, Bali Maharaj is now a devotee of Krishna. Bali Maharaj is now a devotee of Krishna. Bali Maharaj is now a devotee of Krishna. He said that, uh, how, can I, how can I go against my, how can I be a bad character to go against my work? I'm the grandson of Prahlad Maharaj. I have to uphold the family tradition. He didn't say, I'm the son of Virochana. Uh, is he yes. the son of Virochana? Yes, you're the son of Virochana. Right, come on, reject Vishnu. No, I'm the grandson of Prahlad Maharaj. I cannot reject Vishnu. Like uh, Prahlad Maharaj, the beginning when he said that, no, I don't want to be like a devotee. The beginning of what? Uh, like Prahlad Maharaj, right from the childhood, he said that, uh, why Bali Maharaj didn't do the well? Uh, uh, different devotees are different in different ways. Prahlad, he was an innocent boy from the beginning. He may have trained his Bali Maharaj differently. See, in the Bhagavatam, we only get a little information. <laughs> How much the whole life of it, every moment of a devotee's life is wonderful and glorious and strange to Krishna. We only get a little information. Sometimes the Acharyas fill in a little more. But all devotees are different also. It's not all stereotypes. See, Bhakti no Thakura, appeared to be a complete materialist for so many years. So it's not not the same in every case. Variety also. It's all it's not that uh, that's what people say. You become a devotee and then you just you just become that's what the Khanis accuse, you become stereotype, brainwashed. But no, we're not all the same at all. Nor do we want. Yes. And most devotees are at least somewhat eccentric and that's nice. It's not all just the same. That's our philosophy. Everyone is different. No question. Okay, well, you, you're upstage. Can you hear? Can you hear? Sound coming? Yeah. Do we have to be reborn as a king and then we can become a devotee? No. Bhagavatam is a Mahapurana in which one of the subjects is describing the dynasty of kings. So so many kings who are devotees are described. There are others described also. We see Sudama Vipra, Pingala, who was a prostitute, who later became a devotee. So, specifically because this is in the format of a, of a Purana, so the stories of kings come. There are so many devotees that gopis are there. There are also so many devotees there. So, the answer, do you have to become a king? To become a devotee. No. Uh, 
As Vaikuntha Prabhu says, we already have enough politics in the world. <laughs> More chanting. Chant, chant, chant. No, no. Maharaj, it's enough for the We should, uh, Bhakti Sansar Thakur said, devotees are kings of the world. We should become kings, heroes, conquerors, conquer over the senses. That way we should become kings. So we'll finish there. Hare Krishna, Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Bali Maharaj ki jai, Vamandi ki jai.